Happy Saba. It's a privilege for me to sing for for the Lord and for you guys as well. I first heard this song in Spanish. It's called El Clamor Final. And it's titled At the Midnight Cry in English. But for theology sakes, we will call it At the Final Cry. This is the name of the song, At the Final Cry. It's closer now than it has ever been. I can almost hear the trumpet and Gabriel sounds a call at the midnight cry. Steps out on a cloud to call his children. The dead in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air. And those who remain shall be. I cry. 
This week, we've actually been talking about absolute reliance. And something that past uh, brother, um, Jem, has been sharing and kind of emphasizing over and over is that God calls us to be still because oftentimes we don't know what his will for life is. And the hardest thing to do is to trust God when you don't know what's coming up next. When you have a backup plan, it's easy to say, okay, I'm going to trust in God because there's always something to fall back on. But when there's nothing, when you really don't know what's coming up, it's really hard to be still. And yet God says, don't worry, I'm going to be with you. If you trust me, everything will work out together for the best. And although you might not feel like it at the moment, if you are still, he will give you peace and rest.
God is good, amen? amen. God has been really, really good. And uh, it seems like I don't want this, uh, this weekend to end. But somehow it has to end because we know that God has prepared something better than this weekend, amen? amen. Remember that thing that we talked about this, uh, this time in United Prayer. And David has his experience of ecstasy. And ecstasy, all the while I thought that that's nothing compared to joy. <laughs> and joy is nothing compared to delight. And then I've been discovering, discovering that God has something higher and better prepared. Friends, we have not even scratched the surface yet of what God is going to do for each one of you. And just imagine if we come together, continually come together and seek the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God would be so excited to pour out his blessings upon each one. And uh, I always ask this question. When you give a gift to someone, when you present a gift to someone, especially when you look for that gift, when you have been searching the whole amity, or not just amity, <laughs> There's not much gift to find in Amity. <laughs> okay, you have searched the whole of Little Rock <laughs> to find that gift. And you know that that person really, really, really loves that gift. Now it says it's a person's birthday. And the person is opening the gift. Who's more excited, the person or you? Of course, you. And just imagine this is what God is somehow looking at when you're about to open the gift the life that he has prepared for you. It's just like, I could not wait to see the surprise. <laughs> but he knows already the surprise on your face. <laughs> just imagine, friends, God is desiring so much for each one of us. And, and the message that I like to bring to you this, this uh, afternoon, I was really praying, and it's, uh, it's really a blessing to be, to be tired. <laughs> it's a blessing to... To know, to know not what you're going to do because you're so dependent on the Lord. So after the, the salsa and chips dinner, I went back to, I went back to my room and, and just knelt down and prayed. And Lord, what message do you want me to speak? And uh, I almost fell asleep. <laughs> I almost fell asleep. I guess the Lord gave me a power nap, like a two-minute power nap <laughs> before I came here. And the message that the Lord wants me to speak tonight is about joy. We have been talking about joy, been talking about what God desires for each one of us, and, and joy, joy is what He desires for each one of us. Amen? Amen. Only 15 agreed, huh? <laughs> and how do you spell joy again? J -O -Y. What does J stand for? Jesus. No. Others. And why? Yo, so... Jesus, others, and what? Jesus. And you. And friends, can you spell joy without Jesus? How does it sound? Oi. 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 Yeah, oi. Huh? Oi. Oi, today? No, in, in, in Filipino? No, it's like oi. It's like you're shouting oi. <laughs> oi. Oi. You're always surprised. You're always shocked. That's what happens when you don't have Jesus in your life. Do you believe so? You're always just like shocked of what's happening around you. And friends, if you don't have Jesus in your life, you cannot put others. Do you believe so? When you don't have Jesus, you'll be selfish. So what's left? Why? What? Yes, that's the question that you'll always ask. Why? <laughs> Why? So friends, without Jesus, joy is not complete. Amen? So with that being said, let's kneel before the presence of joy. Dear God in heaven, Lord, we just praise you and thank you for you are the God of giver of good gifts. You're the God who loves to see his children joyful. And Lord, thank you for, for teaching us that now we're quite getting it, <laughs> that everything that you desire for us is for our own benefit. So Lord, I pray that whenever the enemy is telling us otherwise, you Lord, please help us to point back to the scripture, to point back to the word. Our God desires the best for us. So Lord, I pray for each and every person who's here, especially for myself, that you 
please, Lord, teach us how to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Help us, Lord, to stay in your presence. And Lord, please help us to run to you always and never to find happiness or joy outside of your presence. And Lord, I pray that may you continue to pour upon us this sense of hunger, this sense of desperation. Teach us, Lord, to be desperate for you. Help us, Lord, to run to you. And dear Father, I pray that you please fill us with your spirit. Dear Father, once again, I pray that you please hide me behind the shadow of your cross, that I may not be seen or be heard, and even the desire to be seen or to be heard, Lord, please take that away. May Jesus alone be seen, be heard, be lifted up, and exalted. And teach us, Lord, how to lift Jesus up higher than we have lifted him up before. And dear Father, I pray as well for each and every person here. Lord, please prepare each and every heart for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray in a very special way for the technical situations that we have. Lord, I pray for for the mics, I pray for all the equipments. Lord, may your special be anointing be in it. And dear Father, I pray that you please send heavenly angels that excel in, in technical stuff. And Lord, I pray that you please anoint this whole place with the anointing of your Holy Spirit. May each and every corner, may each and every side, there will be angels surrounding us. And please, dear Father, once again, pour upon us a full measure of your Spirit. For we ask this in the loving name of your son Jesus, all your children say, Amen. Amen. This message I shared just this last, last August when I, when I was asked to speak at GYC Canada. So this was a divine service message. So the the title of there, uh, the theme of GYC Canada was the cross connection. And the Lord gave me this message to share. I share this message at, the, at a different conference, but it has a different title. And the Lord doesn't wa wants me to, to share this message. And I'm thinking, Lord, what is the connection of this, the cross connection? And the Lord somehow had me kneel down before him so many hours before the Lord somehow gave me the connection. And you know when he gave me the connection? Like 20 minutes before I spoke. God is so good, isn't he? So the title of, of our talk this evening is The Joy of the Cross. The Joy of the Cross. Two years ago, I was uh, asked by my friend to go to, to Korea and to Japan. So I went there and I saw a lot of people who are as tall as me, <laughs> as short as me, but they are faster than me. Everywhere you look, there's just like people who are walking so fast. Everyone is so busy. And I remember even in escalators, because back home in the Philippines, especially like five years ago, when you say escalator, people are just like, no one was really in a hurry. But in this like first world Asian countries, even in escalators, you have to stay on the right if you want, if you want to, to stand by or on the left. And there's a lane for people to just walk, 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 walk. And then one particular Sabbath evening, we were, me and my friend's wife, together with her son, was going to this, to this train station. And my heart began to pound when I saw the number of people in that platform. Because I saw this video in YouTube about people who are being pushed in the train. Have you seen the train pushers? They, they have like officials in the train platform to push people in so that they will fit. Friends, we have a three-year-old who's on a stroller. And I'm thinking, Lord, this, this kid will die. And I, my heart was pounding. I'm thinking, what is going to happen? But praise God, there's, there's no pushers that were involved. Have you seen the, that video? People are being pushed. And here in the, in, in, in the US, if you're touched, like, hey, what, what's wrong? But there, it's like people are just like doing this. <laughs> like, push me some more. <laughs> Seriously. And it's like, until the last, the last piece of clothing is in, and then <laughs> that's, that's how it is. So it's, it's a busy, busy, busy life. 
and I'm seeing people just walking to and fro, but there's is one common denom denominator. There's no joy. There's just like this emptiness, this blank face. And then I realize, whoa, it hit me. It's because they don't know Jesus. A lot of people are going to the grave without knowing Jesus, without joy. But you know what's the worst case scenario? You know what my work is? I go from place to place, visit from church to church, and most of the things that I do is revival and reformation. This is uh, like nurturing. I'm not doing evangelism. So I visit churches. Worst case, the uh, worst thing that I saw is I've seen similarity of the things that I saw outside of things inside a church. Yeah, there's no joy in some of the faces. And I begin to realize, Lord, what is happening? We're supposed to be the most joyful people. Can you say amen? amen. Even your amen is not so joyful. <laughs> <laughs> we are supposed to be the most joyful people. We profess to know the truth. We profess to have Christ. Friends, remember, in His presence is what? Fullness of joy. At its right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. And I begin to realize, Lord, why is it like this? We seem to have, to be Christians, we, we say that we're Christians, but why are we not having this joy that you have promised? Friends, it says, these things I have spoken unto you, remember John 15 verse 11? That my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Psalm 16 verse 11, that will show me the path of life. In thy presence is what? Fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are what? Pleasures forevermore. So friends, I, I just want to, to go right into the message. I was praying and praying the Lord, and, and I was asking the Lord, Lord, please tell me the reason why we don't have this joy. How can we promote Jesus when we are not joyful of our relationship with Jesus? Huh? We're telling people, you want my Jesus? It's, it's not going to work, huh? When you are so excited about something, even before you speak, I want to buy what you have. <laughs> Am I right? Huh? Even before you say something, people would want to have what you have if you have been living that joy that God has promised you. And friends, so in, in the time that I spent with God, the Lord revealed to me three things that takes us away of this joyful experience. The first one is, it says here, many are unable to make definite plans for the future. Their life is unsettled. They cannot discern the outcome of affairs. And this often fills them with anxiety and unrest. Can anyone relate to this? Don't raise your hand. Let us remember the life of God's children in this world is a pilgrim life. We have not wisdom to plan for our own lives. It is not for us to shape our future. First reason that takes away our joy. We plan for our lives and not for the glory of God. Do you believe so? My friends, we forget to live for God. We forget, friends, that we are here in Wachita Hills. Not for us. It's for the glory of God. When I ask people, so is God included in your plans? <laughs> and they said, yes. So what's the role of God in your plans? <laughs> Troubleshooter. <laughs> Most of the time he is. We only think about God in our plans when our plans are not working the way we want it to happen. Do you agree? Huh? But our plans is not really for God. It's really for us. We give everything for our plans to materialize, but not really for Him. It's for us. How do we raise our kids? Praise God, I'm, I'm in a place where you raise kids for the glory of God, but even there is somehow this, this conformity to the world that we're pressuring us that we have to raise kids to be wonderful citizens of this world, but not really wonderful citizens of the world hereafter. Huh? Why are you desiring to have this, to have this career? 
Sometimes it's just for the accolades of this world. Why do you desire to have these relationships? Let's talk about relationships now. <laughs> Our desire for relationship is just for the fulfillment of, of our desire. But are we thinking about relationship? Will this person bring me to heaven? Will I raise a family with this person that will be wonderful citizens of heaven? That should be the end point of your plans. Amen? And, and friends, I, I realized that my planning it's not really working. <laughs> Remember, I told you from the first night that I tried to plan for myself. <laughs> age, age 25, I have my own business. 30, uh, first million, 35, be married, <laughs> have kids, relax, and spend all my millions. <laughs> <laughs> That's a boring life, friends. <laughs> that is a boring life. And then I begin to realize that when God took over my life, friends, I was blown away of what God can do and what God is doing. And I know God has a plan for each one of us. So what is the suggestion? What is God's suggestion? By the way, I'd like to ask you this question. Who is our greatest example? Okay. Anyone agrees? Okay. A lot of people hesitated. <laughs> Okay, everyone agrees that Jesus is our greatest example. So whatever he does, we follow, amen? amen? And then, so he says here, Christ in his life on earth, help in daily living, made no plans for himself. Did you get this? And most of us are bothered about the plans we have here in this life. Christ in his life on earth made what? No plans for himself. He said here, he accepted God's plan for him. And day by day, the father unfolded his plans. So should we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. As we commit our ways to him, he shall direct our steps. Isn't this amazing? As we commit our ways to him, he will what? He will direct your steps. Friends, I believe he's more awesome than Siri. Or the Google Maps. Google Maps will get you lost. Like in 200 meters, turn left. And especially for me, I'm, I'm quite paranoid holding, holding the, the phone whenever we're traveling. This is not 500 meters. This, this looks so short. But God is telling you, now turn to the left. Every step, friends, he's not giving it by meters. He's not giving it by yards. He's not giving it by kilometers. He will give you step by step. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Friends, this is what happens when we absolutely rely on the Lord, especially when we plan for His glory and not for ourselves. Because from that time on that you begin to plan for Him, your life is His. <laughs> Did you get this? And God will not stand back to let you go astray. <laughs> He will lead you as He has promised. As we commit our ways to Him, He will guide our steps. What a promise. So friends, but most of the time, we don't, we don't let Him. We're afraid because we might lose our plans. And it says here, if any man will come after me, Christ says, let him deny himself and take up the cross. And what? And follow me. And David also says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? That the Lord is good. Most of the time we're saying, oh, I might not like it. Have you tasted? Huh? We have not tasted and we're just saying that we don't like it. A lot of you here don't like durian, even though you have not tasted it. Hmm? <laughs> but I won't assure you that you'll like, most of you will not like it. <laughs> it took me 32 years to love it but now I'm addicted to it. <laughs> oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Friends, most of the time we go out finding our own desires and finding nothing. Remember the beautiful promise in, in Matthew 10, verse 39, he who findeth his life shall what? He who loseth his life for my sake shall what? Find it. The question is, which part of that 
promise we do not understand. And still, we go on finding our own life. <laughs> and that's the reason why there's no joy. There's no, that's the reason why we are devoid of the joy that the Lord has promised. It is because we have not really depended on the promise that He gave. He that findeth his life shall lose it. My dear friends, my advice to you tonight, lose your life for his sake and you will find joy. Friends, there is this beautiful thought that says, mm, we are never called upon to make a real sacrifice for God. Many things he asks us to yield to him, but in doing this, we are but giving up that which hinders us in the heavenward way. Anything that he asks us are things that hinders us in the heavenward way. And listen to this. Even when we are called to surrender things which are in themselves good, we may be sure that God is thus working out for us some higher good. Whoa, even good things that he asks us to surrender to him, be sure that he has some higher good prepared for you. I love this next quote. It says, it will require a sacrifice to give your plans or yourself to God, but it is a sacrifice of the lower to the higher. The earthly for the spiritual, the perishable for the eternal. Friends, is this a sacrifice? Huh? Is this a sacrifice? Sacrifice is exchanging something of a higher value to a lower value. That is a sacrifice. But friends, what has been explained to us right now, this is not a sacrifice, this is an upgrade. Did you get this? Huh? And this is one thing I realized. When God is asking you to surrender something, it means to say, you are ready for an upgrade. <laughs> Did you get this? When God is asking you to surrender something, you are ready for an upgrade. But most of the time, we hold on to our Nokia 5110. <laughs> Lord, I love this little antenna. <laughs> These little yellow buttons. <laughs> These squeezy things. <laughs> but God has prepared an iPhone 11 for you. X Max which has not gone out yet in the market. <laughs> and you're, you keep on holding on to your Nokia 5110. But God has this new box. I have something for you that has not ever appeared in the market yet. Isn't it crazy? Friends, when we look at that comparison, it's crazy. But God, what God has prepared for us is better than iPhone, X, uh, iPhone 11 or X1. Friends, isn't it crazy that we cling on, that we hang on to things that are of lower value where God is giving us something that is so invaluable? Have you heard a song? Of course, you know the song, I Surrender All. There is this song by Alison Brooke. It's called, He Surrendered All. Have you heard this? For those of you who do not know, only Jesus, He Surrendered. Only Christ laid glory down. He left heaven and his father put away his royal crown. Only Jesus he surrendered, born a man and yet divine. He was tempted yet triumphant, came to heal your heart and mind. He surrendered all. He surrendered all. All for you and your salvation. He surrendered all. And to think, and we think that we are the ones surrendering for God, my dear friends. What God is offering us is an upgrade. Amen. It's not just an upgrade. It's a whole new level of mind-blowing high level. I don't even know how to put that in words. <laughs> friends, there's only one solution. And listen to this. Too many in planning for a brilliant future make an utter failure. The suggestion is, it's only five words. Let God plan for you. Amen? Amen? Friends, if God is the one planning for you, what do you think will happen? Oh, I lose my plans. No. 
your plans are no good. <laughs> His plans are better. And I remember Sebastian Braxton, a good friend of mine, he says, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> I also follow his, <laughs> tell him your plans. And I remember before I was saying to the Lord, I want to be the best photographer. And the Lord, <laughs> I could picture him. <laughs> <laughs> so when you tell the Lord, I'm gonna be the best engineer. <laughs> he said to the angels, water please. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, if we want to make the Lord laugh, Tell him your plans. And this is something we think that we have the best interest for ourselves. But God has our best interest, friends. God has your best interest. Our minds are too small to think about what God's good plans, great plans for us. So let God plan for you. Amen? Amen. Okay, let us move on to the next. Wow, we are making progress. Number two. <laughs> Number two. So it says here, I love this, this quote from uh, Oswald Chambers, May Atmos for His Highest, he says, the greatest blessing spiritually is the knowledge that we are destitute. You know what destitute means? You know this. I, English is not my first word, so I looked at the meaning of destitute. We are nothing. <laughs> the greatest blessing spiritually is to know that you are nothing. Wow, some of you are hurt. You are nothing. You see, you just laugh. You did not say praise the Lord. <laughs> You're nothing. Well, still they're not convinced. <laughs> praise God, amen. amen. The greatest blessing spiritually is the knowledge that we are nothing. Until we get there, our Lord is powerless. Did you get this? Until we accept and we realize without God we are nothing, the Lord is powerless in your life because you'll always take control. You'll always try to lead and you'll always get yourself lost. Listen, He can do nothing for us if we think we are sufficient of ourselves. We have to enter into His kingdom through the door of destitution. And I love this beautiful quote from Science of the Times. Whatever prevents us from making Christ our entire dependence is abomination in the sight of God. Whatever prevents us from making Christ our entire dependence is abomination in the sight of God. Friends, there's a second reason why we don't have peace and joy because we rely so much on our own strength. Remember, the Lord said, Proverbs 3 verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Let's relate that to, to item number one. Trust the Lord with your plans, amen? amen? Trust the Lord with all your heart in His plans for you. And the second one is, lean not on your own understanding. The reason why we don't have the joy is because we rely so much on our own strength, on what we think is our gift. Listen, friends. Remember in, in the story of Gideon? In the story of Gideon, before they reached the number 300, how many was, was the army collected or gathered? Huh? The first group, how many? 32,000. Thank you, brother. 32,000, and the Lord says, that's too many. Let's, let's break it down. Let's bring it down to how many? Huh? 10,000. And 10,000, they went down to what? To 300. And this, is, this, this one for me is quite crazy because if you read the story of Gideon, the Amalekites and Midianites, friends, they are like the sand of the seashore. They are like locusts in number. And now the 32,000 is not even enough. Do you agree? 32,000 is not even enough. And this is not trained warriors. These are trained laborers. These are trained construction workers. They were not trained to fight. And the Lord says, reduce it. And now from 32 to 10,000, 10,000 to 300. Friends, do you know what's the percentage of 300 over 32,000? Huh? It's not even 
It's 0.9375. Can we round it off to one? No. <laughs> the Lord has to reduce it to almost nothing. To almost nothing. And you know why? Open your Bibles in Judges 7 verse 2. You see the reason why. Judges 7 verse 2. And if you find it, say the word amen. If you're not there, say have mercy. Okay, we'll wait. Okay. Mercy ran out. Okay. Judges 7 verse 2. It says, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim the glory for itself against me, saying, Mine own hand had saved me. You see, friends, even the slaves have the tendency to take the glory from God. So the Lord has to reduce them into almost nothing, into less than 1%, that when the victory is given, they will not have any doubt that the victory was only gained because of God. Amen? This is the desire that the Lord would have for His people, that we lean fully on Him every step of the way. I like this, this thought. The most complete and perfect system which man has ever devised apart from the power and wisdom of God will prove a failure. The next, the next quote, the Lord can do but little for the children of men because they are so full of pride and vain glory. They exalt self, magnifying their own strength, learning and wisdom. It is necessary for God to disappoint their hopes and frustrate their plans that they may learn to trust in Him alone. Remember this quote that we read in the middle of the week? I remember a friend that I met. He's from Oklahoma. He's also from Academy. And his name is Sam. Sam is like 5'11". Five, five He's from Colombia. He was a good football player, but somehow he got injured. And he was, he was uh, taken out of a national team. You know, Colombia is really fond of playing football. And, and you, he was supposed to be, he was trained to be a superstar. And he was not happy about it until he went to, to, to go to school, to our, to our academy. And the Lord showed him that this is the life that he wants Sam to live. So I met him in an army Bible camp. And uh, I was asked to do a week of prayer in OA. And while I was there, his friends told me, oh, Brother Jem, you should listen to Sam's, uh, was this achievement during the canvassing. Sam, friends, was the highest in their canvassing work. He was selling like 20 to 30 or 40 books per day. He was selling a lot. And, and Sam was telling, telling me, no, 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 Brother Jem, it's, it's all because of God. I said, no, 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 no. Sam is trying to be hum playing humble, but uh, you know what? He, he was the highest. And Sam said, Brother Jem, I have to tell you the story. It's not really me. So he put his arm around me when, when the dinner was over. Yeah, I have to tell you the story. And you know me. I'm, I'm not comfortable speaking English just straight. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm from Colombia. English is not my first language. And I have not sold anything in my life. So selling a book to a stranger is like horror for me. So I spend the time praying to God, Lord, please lead me. I don't know what to do. Lead me to the right person. Teach me the right words to say. So the Lord led me to each and every person whom the Lord wanted to meet. And almost every person that the Lord brought to him, he has a sale. Isn't that amazing, friends? So one particular day, he was praying, and he was, I guess, he was at the, the parking lot of Walmart or, or Target. While he was there, he was praying, Lord, please lead me to the right vehicle. And while he was walking around, the Lord led him to this vehicle. He saw a head inside the, the vehicle, said, oh, this is, this is the one. The moment he knocked on the window, he knew that he made, he, in his mind, he knew that he made a ro the wrong choice because this guy was holding a gun. And then the guy opened the window and said, what do you want? Remember, English is not his first language. And he said, oh, oh, the Lord brought me here. <laughs> Which is true. He was asking for the Lord's guidance and the Lord's leading and the Lord brought him there. And then this person, when he heard those words, the Lord brought me here, those person, that person broke down. 
that person broke down and he said to Sam, you are the third person who interrupted my plans of ending my life. You are the third person and for sure, God sent you here. And Sam slowly but surely reached out to the shoulder of that guy, comforted the guy with the words that the Lord has placed in his heart to speak. And at the end of that, he asked the person if, if the person would give his life to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to this person and the person gave his heart to Jesus. Amen. Sam prayed for this person. And at the end of their conversation, the person bought a book from Sam. <laughs> Just imagine that, friends. He was planning to commit a suicide and, be and became a customer later on. Isn't that amazing? And then he, Sam told me, so brother Jem, it's not because of me. It's all God. If I was left alone, I would not have sold one book, but God is the one leading me. Amen. Friends, this is why the Lord is teaching us, lean on him, amen? amen? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. We do not have joy because we rely so much on our own strength where God is asking us to what? To rely on Him. Friends, there's this beautiful, beautiful quote. There is nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins, it is the most hopeless. Did you get this? There's nothing so dangerous as pride and self-sufficiency of all the sins. This is the most hopeless. Because you know what, friends? If you are prideful, if you are self-sufficient, you will not need a savior. Did you get this? You will not need God. You will not need a savior. And this is really important because it says in Desire of Ages 300, paragraph one, from the soul that feels its need, nothing is withheld. Wow, how much do we need God? That's how much we'll have God. <laughs> how much do we need God? And, and friends, this is one beautiful thing. When we realize our weakness, our nothingness, we rely so much on the Lord. And God has chosen the foolish things of this world, <laughs> the base things of this world, the weak things of this world, to prove to people that He is God, amen? I have another story that, uh, that somehow happened to me just last year. While preparing for the GC Annual Council, every year we go to the general conference to pray for the whole meeting. And that particular Sabbath was the arrival of my friend coming from, from Europe. Their family went to, went to Europe and uh, he's flying from Europe to Washington DC. And I was already in Maryland. And it was Sabbath and he's arriving at seven. And from Maryland going to, going to Washington DC, it will take you like two hours. So I'm thinking, Lord, I don't want to, to go and get a taxi on Sabbath and thinking, I don't have peace. I need your leading, I need your guidance. And remember the Lord has, has promised, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with mine eye. So I, I, check, I check Uber, how much Uber will cost from from Maryland to Washington DC. Friends, it will cost me like $76. I'm thinking, whoa, this costs like an airplane ride back home. And also here, isn't it? It's an airplane ride, just, just land. And then it will cost you like plane. And I'm thinking, Lord, this is too much. And I was asking, so Lord, please give me other options. And friends, I was looking at, at the bus ride. <laughs> the bus ride, it will, it will cost me like, $40, and I will transfer like three, five, six times. I'm thinking, I'm gonna get lost. I might be able to, to arrive in, in the airport on time. And I was just praying, Lord, I, I, need your, I need your idea, enough of my idea. The Lord brought me back to Uber, and I saw Uber pool. Oh, an Uber pool, you'll be riding in that private car with other people. And I have not done that. Before, when I checked the price, $32. This is good. <laughs> this is way better than $76. So I asked the Lord what time, and the Lord somehow gave me the peace to go at six. 
Six was still not sunset, friends. And, but the Lord gave me peace to grab that, that Uber ride at six. So you remember, when this is pool, you cannot just wait and be picked up. You have to go to the pick-up place. So I was waiting there at six for the place where I'm going to be picked up. And I saw in, in the app that this ride was like stuck in a corner going around and around and around. I'm thinking, is he lost? And then like after like three minutes, he pulled out and then he picked me up. And it was quite a windy day. So I went in and then all of a sudden the wind blew the door and then I'm bang! It was a bad entrance. And the guy said, man, careful with my door. I said, it was not me, it's the wind. <laughs> and friends, he's, he's a guy, he's a big guy, an African-American guy who was this huge gold chain with a huge pendant and he has like a lot of golden rings. So he was blinged. So, <laughs> so while he was there and I was trying to be friendly with him, I was, I was in the front seat and I was looking at him, he was not happy. And I asked him, how are you, man? <laughs> and he said, oh, I have a lot of things to complain, especially you, I did not say that. I have a lot of things to complain about, but, but I choose not to complain. There's a lot of things to be thankful for. I said, I like your attitude, man. And then he noticed that I'm quite chatty, so he opened the window. And while he was driving, and while he was driving, uh, he asked me, do you know reggae? And I'm thinking, oh Lord, he's gonna play reggae. <laughs> and it's Sabbath. And, and he said, yes, I'm from the islands, I know reggae. And I said, would you mind if I, if I play some reggae? I was about to say, please don't. The Lord put his hand on my mouth. And I, I, I didn't have any, uh, anything to say, so he played reggae. And then while I was playing reggae, the window was down, and then he asked me a question. It's his fault, he asked me a question. And he asked, so, are you from here? And then I told him, no, I'm just visiting. Oh, so how long are you here for? Oh, just like a couple of weeks, and then I go to another place, and another place, and another place. I told him, I said, oh, so you often travel. What do you do? And I told him, I'm an assassin. And, <laughs> and then that caught his attention when he looked at me like that. <laughs> of course, I'm Asian, so like, <laughs> no, don't underestimate the little Asian dude. <laughs> so I told him, I, that caught his attention. I told him, no, I'm a missionary. He said, oh, okay. <laughs> so he asked me questions. He told me, so what do you do? Ding, 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 <laughs> testimony time. <laughs> so the more I told him my testimony, friends, you know what happened? He turned down the volume of reggae. I said, thank you, Lord. He turned it down and lower and lower until he turned it off. And then he put up the window. And then he began asking more questions and more questions. And the more I talked to him, the more I see his demeanor changed. And he began to open up and he told me, sometimes I really doubt that ex about the existence of God. I said, why did you say that? He had just this past two months alone, two of my closest friends, a relative and a closest buddy died because of gang, gang violence. And I told him, you know what? Bad things are happening because we are living in the world of sin. But I believe that even in the, in the worst case scenario, God is still good. And he said, I kind of believe that, but there's, it's somehow so hard. So we begin to, to talk more and more and more. And friends, you know what? He told me, you know what? I don't even want to drive this taxi right now. I, I'm in this two-month funk, he told me. I'm in a two-month depression. This is the darkest place of my life right now. And, and guess what? If not for my daughters right now who are sick, who are in the custody of their mother, I would, not be, I would not be out right now driving. I would just stay at the house. And I, all the things that I'm doing right now is just to pay for the bills, to pay for the needs of my kids. So while he was sharing this to me, the Lord spoke to my heart, give him what I gave you last week. And someone gave me $100 a week before. And I asked the Lord, all of it? <laughs> And the Lord convicted all. I said, mm-hmm. 
And friends, when the Lord says so, you have to do so. Amen? So I took the hundred dollars, and friends, I give tips, but not hundred dollars. And when I, when I took that hundred dollars, when I was preparing it, the Lord convicted me, give it to him now. And friends, usually we give tips when? When we get off the vehicle, after the ride. But this time, the Lord is strongly prompting me, give it to him now. So friends, I took the hundred dollars and I told him, by the way, his name is Sean. I said, hey, Sean, this is for you. And he said, what's that? That's from the Lord, that's for you. I said, why? I said, because the Lord says so. Why? <laughs> because the Lord says so. <laughs> and friends, you could see the shock in his face. You know, this doesn't make sense. I said, what doesn't make sense? This. I said, what this? You this hundred dollars. You're a poor missionary. You told me. You don't receive any salary and then you're giving me this. I said, that's why it's not from me. It's from the Lord. <laughs> so when I gave it to him, he could not believe. And he keep on pounding his, his what's this? His steering wheel. I said, you just don't know. Jim, you just don't know. And I see him really intense. I said, come down, man. <laughs> I was afraid he's going to punch me. <laughs> I said, you just don't know. And he kept on talking to me. You just don't know. I was afraid. I'm thinking, look at the road, not me. And then he told me, you just don't know, Jem. You just don't know what this means. And he elaborated more on what he was experiencing. Yeah, I'm in a two-month, four-month depression. I have a lot of abandonment issues in my life. Yet I... The loss of those two precious souls really hit me so hard. Yeah, I could not get up. I could not get up in the morning, in the evening. I wake up sometimes late at night. And you know what? I did not have any plans to work. But I was awakened 5 a.m. I'm not a morning person. But I was awakened at 5 a.m. And I don't know what happened, but somehow there's this voice that's saying to me, I will do something for you today. That's why you just don't know what this means. You just don't know. And he told me, you saw me going around and around and around maybe in your app because I didn't want to pick you up. You are my first customer. I just, I just decided to get out of the house and work at six. And, and I was going around and going around because I have not accepted Uber pool before. You are my first Uber pool. I told him, you are my first pool too. <laughs> Isn't God amazing, friends? Yeah, and while you were sharing those things to me, I was somehow, there's this voice that's telling me, listen to him, he's sincere. And I told him, it's the Holy Spirit. And then when you came in, you slammed my door. And I said to him, it's the wind, remember? And you, you slammed my door and you were chatty and I don't want to talk. I just want to drive. And of all the passengers, I have not had a passenger who, who jumps right and sits beside me. Most of them sits behind the back, at the back. And I'm thinking, he doesn't know Filipinos. Filipinos want to be in front. <laughs> And while, while I was driving, while you're telling me all this, I don't know, something is just like speaking in my heart. Listen to what he's going to share to you. Friend, isn't God amazing? When we don't know what to do, the Lord will teach us. So while we were driving, while we were driving, friends, there is this, there's this uh, something that, that beeps in his phone. It's another customer. Remember, it's a pool. Huh? So other people will come in. I'm thinking, oh, Lord, this will disrupt our conversation. So I was praying and praying, and he said, no, I'll cancel this. This ride is only for you. Aww. Of course, it's $132 now. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, this ride is only for you. But I, didn't meet, I did not mind about the $100 that the Lord has placed in his hands. And friends, it was a really wonderful conversation. He told me about his abandonment by his mom, by his first girlfriend. His first girl girlfriend sent him to prison. So he has a lot of records. He has a lot of bad experiences. This, this soul is wounded. 
So we were talking and talking, and, and I, I could feel the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the taxi. And then, so before he dropped me off, he told me, Jem, I have one more request. I know you have given me a lot of favors already, but I have one request. And I said, what is that, Sean? That before you leave the vehicle, can you pray for me? And I told him, Sean, even if you don't ask, I'll pray for you. So friends, when he dropped me off, when the vehicle stopped, I put my hand on his shoulder and prayed for him. Friends, this, this bulky guy, this guy that, that is blinged, began to cry. And then after that, he gave me a huge hug. I gave him all the glow tracks that I have collected that Sabbath morning <laughs> and all the other booklets that the Lord had me collect. I don't collect much glow tracks because I know I'm, I'm carrying a lot. But that morning, the Lord just spoke to my heart, get this, get this, get this. And I gave it all to him. And I gave him my card and I said, I don't have $100 more to give you, <laughs> but if you need prayer, give me a call. That guy was just crying and then he hugged me and he said, wow, Lord, it is such an awesome thing when it's you leading the way. Amen? When God is the one in charge of our plans. So while I, while I was going, to was this to pick up my friend i have a testimony to tell him and we keep on praying and praying to sean for sean friends three days later i re i looked at my phone and i have some missed calls in my whatsapp and i'm thinking who is this and then later on that person on the third day of, of the missed call gave her name and he said this is claudette sean's mom and I did not realize that Sean gave my card to his mom. And he told his mom, call this guy. He will pray a blessing for you. <laughs> so until now, I've been communicating with Sean's mom. <laughs> Getting update with Sean. And Claudette, one time, we had a very nice call. She told me about what her issues were. She abandoned Sean because... As a kid, she was abandoned as well. These are two hurting individuals. And friends, this is what God desires for us to experience. There's a lot of Sean's and Claudette out there. And God would want us to lead them to them, lead us to them, if we consider that we are nothing without God. Amen? If we know that we could not direct our own path, God will direct us to them. So friends, what is the first reason why we don't have joy that the Lord has promised. We what? We make our own plans and not for the what? Glory of God. Number two, rely on our own strength. We rely on our own selves. So number three, before I share number three, there is this story that really made me question the character of God. I'll share it with you. This is like a confession right now. You know, when we, are, when we are at this age, we have a lot of questions to the Lord. Huh? And there's one story in the Bible that made me question the character of God. And this is the story of, of the Israelites before they crossed, before they crossed, not, not the Red Sea, but before they conquered Canaan. Remember, and this story if you have your Bibles with you, please open it in Numbers 13, verses 1 and 2. What book? Chapter and verse? 13, 1 and 2. Numbers 13, verses 1 and 2. If you're there, say amen. Okay. So let us read. And the Lord spake unto Moses. Who spoke unto Moses? The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan. So who gave the command? The Lord. You know what, for me it doesn't make sense. Why would the Lord ask Moses to send men to search the land? Because if God sees before things happen, he already knew that this group, this generation of this faithless generation will not go forward. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? This group, of people, the Israelites will not go forward if they heard negative reports. The Lord sees that 10 will come back. 
and give negative reports. And I'm thinking, Lord, you set up your people for failure. So I was not so happy with the story. I closed my book and thinking, you are unfair. But God is so patient with me. <laughs> Until I was reading one time about this story. It's found in Signs of the Times. Signs of the Times, it says here, the proposition to send men to search the land was first made by the people. Did you get this? In the verse that we read a while ago, in Numbers, who said, who gave the command? The Lord. But it says here in Signs of the Times, the proposition to send men to search the land was first made by the people. This doesn't make sense. It's contradicting, isn't it? Huh? But then, friends, while I was sharing this with some of my friends, while I was sharing this in one, in one of the churches, one of my friends said, Jem, we are studying about that, about that, that story. Go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Deuteronomy. This is the time, the preparation for the Israelites before they crossed Jordan before they surrounded Jericho. Deuteronomy, it's the fifth book of the Bible. So it says here, Behold, the Lord thy God had set the land before thee, go up and possess it, as the Lord God Moses was relating to them of what had happened in Canaan. So Moses was telling them of what had happened in Canaan. Listen, Behold, the Lord thy God had set the land before thee, go up and possess it, as the Lord... God of thy fathers hath said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. Verse 22. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us that they shall search out the land. Friends, whose idea was it? Huh? It was the people's idea. The reason why God gave the command, because they wanted it. They gave it to Moses. And that's why the Lord gave them permission to do it because they are already set. They are already insistent. Friends, there's two wills. God's perfect will. And what's the next one? Permissive will. If we keep on insisting it, the Lord will give it to us to teach us a lesson. Listen, friends. Listen. Listen carefully. But as it pleased Moses, he presented the matter before the Lord and obtained his consent for them to go. The result was disaster and destruction. Friends, I'd like to ask you a question. Is, is the idea to search the land a good or a bad idea in general? Is what? Good. It's a good idea. You have to test the waters before you jump in, isn't it? You have, you have, you have to see for yourself, what is waiting for us? Friends, it's a good idea. It's one of the best ideas, but get this. If it's not God's idea, it's disastrous. If it's not God's idea, even if it's a good idea, it will bring distraction. Amen? Now it's getting less. Those people are convinced. Friends, listen. Even if it's the best idea that you could think of, if it's not God's idea, it will bring distraction. Listen. Listen to this. Had they waited for the Lord to say, go forward and follow the divine leader, they would have seen the majesty and glory of God as, they, as verily as they saw it 40 years afterwards. Did you hear that? Friends, did you hear that? Do you want me to repeat it again? Had they waited for the Lord to say, go forward and follow the divine leader, they would have seen the majesty and glory of God as verily they saw it 40 years afterwards. If they only waited. But sometimes we don't have time to wait. It's more 
engaging to take action than to wait on God. And what was the result, friends? What was the result? 40 years. 40 years of going around the wilderness is because of their brilliant ideas. Friends, let's ask ourselves, why are we still here now? We should be in heaven by now. 1888, we should be in heaven during the time, and praise God, they didn't go, or else we would not be here. Huh? And why are we still here now? It's because of our brilliant ideas. It's because of our amazing ideas. No matter how amazing or brilliant your ideas, how calculated your ideas are, if it's not God's ideas, it will get us lost. It did not just cost them 40 years. It cost them their lives. They were not able to enter Canaan. It's because of their brilliant ideas. How many more lessons do we need to learn? How many more deaths do we have to see before we accept God's idea is the best idea? Friends, it's time to give it all to God, amen? This is the time to lean on God for everything. Friends, whatever is distracting you, focus here right now. This is gonna cost lives again. God's ideas is the only way out of this world. God's idea is the only way that could keep you in the straight and narrow that could give us salvation. Friends, stop bringing your own brilliant ideas. Instead, come to Him. The reason why we don't have the joy that the Lord has promised is because we do not wait on Him. And people will tell me, so Jem, how long should we wait? As long as it takes. Because your idea is not worth it. <laughs> The loss of lives is not worth it. The roaming around for 40 years, again, is not worth it. Not entering the promised land is not worth your brilliant ideas. Friends, stop leaning on your own strength. Stop planning for your own lives. And wait on the Lord. Amen? Amen. Wait on Him. It says here, the Lord often permits men to have their own way to teach them that the way he marks out is the only safe path for them to follow. There is a way that the Lord has marked out. And all we have to do, when we are not clear, when we are not peace, friends, let's kneel together and ask the Lord, Lord, please empty us of our own ideas. Empty us of our own desire. Empty us of our own plans. What is your plans? What is your desire for us? What is your desire for this school? What is your desire for these students? And students, what is your desire for my life? Spend time on your knees. Wait on the Lord. You'll never regret the decision. It's not worth going ahead of God. You not go ahead of God. You can never go ahead of Him. Amen? Stay in his presence. Oh. And you know, there's also another story that get me question the character of God. And that is the story of, of Moses. Moses, for me, is one of those persons who has received a lot of injustice in his life. That's what I perceive. That's how I perceive Moses. He was asked to lead a very challenging group of people, <laughs> hard-headed group of people, and very challenging friends. And you saw Moses only with one little sin, only one sin, he was not able to enter Canaan. He was not able to enter Canaan. I'm thinking, Lord, Again, I pointed my finger to God. This is unfair. What you did to Moses was unfair. I said, why? What, is this the way you treat your faithful servant? 
I was trying to question the character of God. And then, because I don't have patience, praise God, our God is very patient. Amen. I closed my book again, and I started grumbling. And then when I calmed down, the Lord had me read this beautiful quote from, from Science of the Times. Friends, just imagine, a few chapters before this, Moses was asked to climb the mountain to bury his brother. And that was his best friend. And when he was going down, he was mourning, and the whole Israel, Israelites were mourning for Aaron. And then a few chapters later, Moses was asked by God to climb Mount what? Nebo. And while he was climbing, while he was preparing to, to climb Mount Nebo, the Lord instructed him, you bring no one. It's gonna be you only, and you will die there. Friends, just imagine, for Moses to go climbing on Mount Nebo, and he's not, He's not sure who's gonna bury him because for them, burial is very important, isn't it? A decent burial is very, very important. So while he was there on Mount Nebo, the Lord somehow showed him Canaan, the place that he is not allowed to enter. I'm thinking, Lord, you're torturing your servant. Huh? It's like, it's, it's enough that he could not enter Canaan. And now you're putting him in a vantage point that he will see Cain and the land is not, is not allowed to enter. It's like dangling a burger in front of a hungry kid. A vegan burger, of course. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Lord, you are just cruel. I closed again the book and did not read. Again, the Lord was so patient with me. Isn't God a patient God? <laughs> And then I read on, I read on my dear friends. And, and in this situation, Moses did not complain. Moses did not cry out to the Lord, like why are you doing this to me? Because he learned his lesson. He learned his lesson while he was in Egypt. He thinks he can do it, so he went ahead of God. And the Lord has to bring him to the wilderness to make him learn the lesson of God. And this time, just imagine, Moses was not, was not freed from the biggest test. He was standing before God and he was still facing a lot of this test. And listen to this. This really somehow tipped me to that breaking point. Listen, he was not beyond temptation and there was a mystery and awfulness about the scene before him from which his heart shrank. Listen, he was in the full vigor of health with all his powers in active exercise. Moses was not dying. Did you get this? He was not weak. He was, he was not like walking badly. He was, his body was in full vigor of life. Friends, I'm thinking, it's a different story when, when you're dying than you're ready to die. Moses could outrun kids. Did you get this? Full vigor, inactive exercise. And yet he was not allowed to go. He could have questioned God, but Moses did not. Moses did not. And while he was there, a panorama was open before him. The Lord showed him, the Lord showed him the Israelites go into the promised land. He saw how they conquered Canaan. He saw as well in the far distant future how, how they rebelled against God. He saw Jesus coming as a child in a manger. He saw Jesus choosing his disciples. He saw Jesus hanging on the cross. He saw Jesus resurrected and gone back to heaven. He saw Jesus coming down as a king. Friends, the Lord opened this panorama before him. And then the Lord laid him to rest. And while he was laid to rest, who came to visit? Huh? Satan came to visit. He wants to claim the body of Moses because he said, he's mine. And during that time, there's no precedence of resurrection yet. And you know what? Christ did not go into controversy with Satan. I could picture the fight and Satan was trying to argue with Jesus. And Jesus said, talk to the hand. <laughs> Friends, when you read Jude, he used the word Michael. Michael. That was the name of Jesus he used every time he's ready for war. 
Jesus fought for Moses. Amen? Amen. Jesus fought for Moses. And friends, get this. Imagine you're Moses. Imagine you're Moses. You open your eyes after you die. And the first person that you see was the God that you desire to see the glory. The first person that you see was the God who hid you on a cleft of the rock. Now you could see him face to face. When I read that story, I broke down. I broke down, you know why? Because my ambition for Moses was too low. I wanted him to cross the earthly Canaan. But God has a higher ambition for Moses. He wanted him to cross the heavenly Canaan. And I knew for a fact that Moses did not complain of not crossing the earthly Canaan. Friends, it is such a sad, sad thing that we hang on to our plans, to our ambitions in this life, that we forget that God's plans is way higher than our plans. Friends, let's open our eyes. Let's stop numbing our brains. And let us pray that the Lord will open each and every eyes here, that we will see the plans that God has for us. Stop living this life for yourself only. Start living it for Him. Heaven begins here. Amen? <laughs> Practice it right now. Heaven begins here. Make a little heaven here in Wachita. Amen? Amen? God has something prepared for this place. God has something prepared for each and every person here. Let him have you. Let him have your plans. Let him have your strength. And spend much time waiting on him because he desires to give it to you. And stop settling for earthly Canaan. <laughs> you have a heavenly Canaan as your final destination. You are just having a layover here. <laughs> this is not the final destination on your ticket. Look at your ticket. Look at your passport. And for those of you who are immigrants here, don't get comfortable in the US. US is a beautiful place, but this is not the best place. Heaven is way better. Amen? Amen. Friends, let's stop aiming for heaven. And promise me, if, even if we don't see each other, bring as many people as you can. Let the joy of the Lord overflow in your life that they may see Jesus in you. Amen? Amen? It is time to lift Jesus up. It is time to lift him up higher. Reforms are important. Other things are important. But friends, all those things will just follow if you focus on Jesus. Amen? Amen. And let's, let's start lifting Jesus. And let's gather each one. Let's, let's walk until the shores of Canaan, hand in hand, all together. And I promise, no prodigal left behind. <laughs> Amen? Amen? With that being said, I'd like to request once again those who came forward for the appeal this morning are our beloved brothers and sisters who decided to give their hearts to the Lord. Come. So, praise God, friends, that uh, again, I present to you this, this group of of young people who wants to take this journey until Canaan. Amen? Amen? And from this time on, it's not just Canaan in this world. It's no good. Let's, let's focus there. Amen? Amen? And I'd like to extend this invitation once again. If there's still someone in the group who wants to join this, this group of young people, 
to give their hearts to the Lord. I'd like to open this, this time right now before we end. Come. Don't be afraid. If the Lord is speaking to your heart, come forward. Let's walk the heavenly shores together. If you're not coming forward, start praying. You know that every day is a battle. Let's, let's let the Lord win this battle today. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. God is good, friends. Always continue to be sensitive to your neighbors. Each one has a battle that they need to fight. And we need each other. Amen? Do not give up on one another. So is there anyone else that wants to come and say, Lord, I want to give all to you. Take me. I don't want to live for myself anymore. I've, I'm done of ambitions of earthly Canaan value. I want to have an eternal Canaan. That is your desire. Come, join us here. Heads bowed.